Chime computationally images the overhead sky this way 400 million times a second, every second of every day. Yes, it turns out there's nothing in there that you could go and just call the right company and say, build me that. And that's driven the design of this thing you see here, this, which is quite a goofy looking telescope. Little did I know that we would be part of something so large, so extraordinary and so incredibly amazing. We are here today uh, to celebrate a milestone in Canadian radio astronomy, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, uh, known as CHIME for short, is a radio telescope unlike any other. It will perform the largest survey of the universe ever undertaken, and it does this without any moving parts. It is Canada's largest radio telescope. We're here at the White Lake Observatory. That's its common familiar name in the South Okanagan. And indeed, we're looking at some of the wonderful old telescopes that have been working here for many years and advancing astrophysical science in many ways. And today, we're gathered here for a particularly special event. This is the launching of CHIME, C-H-I-M-E, which is the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. And it is a one only in the world facility and people from all across the country involved in astronomy and astrophysics have come here to celebrate this hands-on, home-built, home-grown, no moving parts telescope which will radicalize the collection of information about the universe. In 2007, astronomers discovered a puzzling phenomenon. Data recorded several years earlier by the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia showed a fleeting but powerful burst of radio emission coming from an unidentified source in space. In the decades since then, scientists have spotted two dozen of these split-second blasts, known as FRBs, fast radio bursts. And while they've determined that the bursts come from far beyond our own galaxy, the source of these powerful emissions remains a mystery. It's not often that scientists get to discover and study a brand new phenomenon, a, a fresh new puzzle to tackle. And we really don't know what fast radio bursts are. We know they're coming from far outside the Milky Way galaxy, and some people hypothesize they're coming from neutron stars, but we really don't know that. Uh, it's currently an open mystery. Conventional radio telescopes can only see a tiny portion of the sky at any one time and so they have to just by luck happen to catch one when it goes off. We think they're going off something like a thousand times across the whole sky each day but you never know in what direction and so you need a telescope that can see a very large area of the sky to really be able to study the phenomenon. Astronomers are about to get just such a telescope, thanks to a collaboration among 50 scientists from the University of British Columbia, University of Toronto, McGill University, and the National Research Council of Canada. This new and revolutionary radio telescope, just completed in Penticton, British Columbia, is called CHIME. CHIME is made up of four 100-meter half-pipes. These half-pipes focus radio waves to 256 antenna running down the center of the pipe. But unlike traditional radio telescopes with steerable dishes, CHIME doesn't move. Instead of focusing on a point in the sky, it gathers radio signals along a line in the sky, running from north to south. CHIME was originally designed to explore the history of the universe and help us understand dark energy. It turned out to be an ideal design to discover fast radio bursts as well. So we'll be able to use the telescope for both targets simultaneously. With CHIME, we'll see a huge area of the sky at once, something like a thousand times greater than conventional telescopes. Not only that, since the Earth rotates, each night we'll see the entire northern sky. This should allow us to detect between a few and a few dozen fast radio bursts per night. CHIME will be gathering a huge amount of data, as much as all the data flowing in the world's mobile networks. And because this is too much data to store, it must be processed as it's gathered. CHIME researchers have designed custom processors and developed innovative software that allows the CHIME supercomputer brain to sift through the raw data looking for radio wave spikes. Part of the challenge is that radio pulses get stretched as they travel through space, as this visual simulation of a radio pulse shows. 
As a result, pulses that lasted only a thousandth of a second at their source are spread over many seconds by the time they reach Earth. This makes detection even more difficult. We are interested in, in this 15 minutes because we know a known source is going up. You already know, yesterday I found 15 pulses. Members of the research team are working on software to reconstruct the signal's original spiked shape, enabling CHIME to detect radio bursts from distant reaches of the universe. We'll be you know, looking at the whole sky visible to CHIME at any time, hunting for these short signals. For the very brightest ones, though, we are going to be able to record a small snippet of data right around the pulse, and we're going to be able to then dig into it on really short timescales, and hopefully that will help us to figure out a little bit more about how these bursts are emitted at their source, whatever the sources might be. Other astronomers around the world will also help in the hunt for fast radio bursts. When CHIME detects a pulse, they will be notified within seconds and will be able to point their telescopes at the points of interest in the sky. CHIME is the first major telescope to be built in Canada in over 30 years. And experience shows that scientific knowledge is always improved by new instrumentation. So we're really looking forward to making great progress on two hot scientific topics, dark energy and fast radio bursts. It's a real uh, privilege and very exciting to have the opportunity to really make progress on a new uh, and very interesting astrophysical mystery. We've designed an experiment to study the properties of dark energy. And we're going to do that by mapping a huge volume of the universe. These will not be gorgeous pictures of distant spiral galaxies, but a, a very sensitive picture of where structure is in the whole universe. And so what it ends up providing us is a three-dimensional map of where all structures are, where all things in, in the universe are. And by tracing those through cosmic time, from when the universe was a fraction of its present age to today, we can figure out how the universe grew up, how it expanded, um, and, and how it evolved. We think that this and similar experiments of super deep cosmological measurements are, are going to form an important part of the next uh, 10 or 20 years in astronomy. CHIME is not your everyday telescope. CHIME features four 20-meter by 100-meter long semi-cylindrical reflectors similar in size to snowboard halfpipes, with 1,024 radio receivers placed along the centers of the cylinders. Signals from the radio receivers, sensitive at about 40 to 80 centimeter wavelengths, are digitized and sent to custom-built processors that sort this massive amount of information into usable images. Traditional telescopes use large, expensive dishes that collect light from a small region of the sky. This makes it easy to zoom in on a small region of the sky if you are interested in studying a specific object like a star or a galaxy. But CHIME is different. CHIME can connect the spaces between these objects and piece together a more complete map of the sky. Along the center of CHIME's cylindrical dish, many detectors are able to localize objects in the overhead sky and extract concise information about them. CHIME is actually oriented from north to south, and it makes use of the Earth's rotation to sweep a great arc of the sky. Finally, it's now possible to map out a large section of the sky and study in more detail its most mysterious and intriguing parts. Innovative developments in telescopes enable us to look to the edges of space and further back in time than would ever have been possible with our own senses. Fast radio bursts, dark matter, dark energy, the accelerating expansion of our universe, and ultimately its birth. Unraveling the mind-blowing mysteries of the cosmos no longer seems like a faraway dream, but an emerging reality. This telescope, of course, is radically different. 
nothing moves. And the, the dishes collect light, and the light is coming from the very north all the way to the south, and all this light is raining down on the telescope, and the brain, the processor, the computers that sit behind it is sorting out those radio waves so that we're able to reconstruct the image of the overhead sky. We're able to see everything from this horizon to the far northern horizon um, at the same time. Finally, we have no moving parts, but the Earth moves. So as the Earth rotates, we scan out the night sky like a flatbed scanner and are able to reconstruct everything that's overhead every single night. It's just that our eyes see one thing, and this radio telescope sees another. So the radio waves, the same thing that your car antenna collects, rains down on, on this, this dish. It's reflected up to the feed line here. And so there's a line, and there's uh, 256 different antennas down that line. Each one of those is like a pixel in your digital camera except it's seeing that whole overhead sky. So we have a challenge there. We have each antenna seeing the whole sky, and we have to bring the signals down through a set of cables to uh, a hut where we have custom digital electronics that record those signals and process them to figure out what sky overhead would have produced those radio waves. And so let's walk over there now and have a look mm -hmm. at it. You'll see we have uh, one final receiver to end place on the telescope. It is bolted to the telescope walkway and it's just waiting for a helping hand to lift it into its final position to uh, complete the telescope. So um, I think we should begin. One of the people here today to celebrate was the Minister of Science, the Honorable Kirsty Duncan. This remarkable facility is a homegrown technological feat that registers on an international scale. Radio astronomy is one of the technologies pioneered right here in Canada. As you heard, with no moving parts, CHIME will measure over half the sky each day as the Earth turns. Its custom-built supercomputer will crunch through nearly one terabyte of data per second. The experiments done here will produce a three-dimensional map of cosmic structure over the largest volume of the universe ever observed. This map will enable cosmologists all over the world to better discern the cause of the universe's accelerating expansion. Right now, we know that the universe is mostly made up of dark energy. In fact, there is more dark energy in the universe than anything else combined. Stars, planets, comets, asteroids, the gravitational pushing of dark energy, the force that many believe is linked to the expansion of the universe, is stronger than the gravitational force that pulls all matter together. The question is why? Understanding the nature of dark en energy is central to fundamental physics. And by finding out more about this mysterious force, we will enhance our understanding of the universe and its origins. We wouldn't be able to do this without CHIME. This marvelous piece of technology represents a giant leap in our ability to understand space. Because the universe is expanding, we now live in a time where there's twice as much dark energy as everything else all put together. Uh, we know that it's there because we see its effects on the shape of the universe and on the expansion rate. The problem is we have no idea what it is. We just know what it's doing. So we're here to try to find out by looking what dark energy really is. And that's driven the design of this thing you see here, this, which is quite a goofy looking telescope. We need to see the whole sky. So we've made these long tubes which focus a north-south line onto our receivers. We need to be extraordinarily sensitive and to run for years. And so we've got 2,000 antennas at the focus of these reflectors. And then 2,000 signals in 2,000 cables doesn't make a usable data set at all. So we have five truckloads of computers running flat out in a 300 kilowatt power generator in order to make these signals into uh, useful scientific data. My understanding of our chapteeth and our stories is that um, at one time, Coyote, uh, who um, is, is, a, is a teacher, um, he took his eyes out and he, he removed them and he threw them. And his eyes went around the world. 
And there's a lesson to that. There was a lesson about, about why he did that. And you know, when I heard that story when I was really young, I was like, what does that mean? You know, what, what were they talking about? What did they see? What did they know? Why, why do we need to know these stories? And when they were put back into his sockets, he was different because the things that he saw were different and he became different. And so when we think about this amazing tool that we have with Western science and Western technology, and we think about how we are going to think different and the difference that it's going to make in our lives to make things better. And if we come about it from that way, then we're all coming about it, which I know that this team of hardworking individuals, you know, I really want to acknowledge the team of 50 people that really worked hard to make this happen, and the university scholars, and, and, and all of the people from the day one that helped make this happen. So um, with that, I hope that you have a nice time when you're here on the Okanagan Territory. Um, I hope that um, these things continue where our relationships are building and fostering through means of traditional science knowledge and Western science. So it's an honor to be here, White Limlimt. Making this kind of cosmic map, covering such a huge volume of space has never been attempted before because it's never before been possible. Chime computationally images the overhead sky this way 400 million times a second, every second of every day. Chime can see in a thousand different directions at the same time and even pursue many goals in parallel. It's really a breakthrough instrument. As you've heard, Chime will be a tremendous instrument for studying the history of the universe, but thanks to its novel and creative design, it will simultaneously tackle one of the hottest and most puzzling astrophysical problems today, the mystery of fast radio bursts. This phenomenon consisting of short bursts of radio waves coming from far outside our Milky Way galaxy was discovered only a decade ago, yet today we know these bursts are ubiquitous, something like a thousand across the sky each day. We do not know their origins. There are many ideas of what they could be, indeed more ideas than actual number of events detected, just over two dozen. But CHIME will be a game changer in this field. We estimate that we will detect at least two dozen in our first week of full operations. And moreover, we will find them in real time and immediately send alerts to the global astronomical community so that colleagues around the world can help in the pursuit of the nature of these elusive objects. And importantly, CHIME's novel design will also enable significant additional science projects simultaneously, notably monitoring every known radio pulsar in the CHIME visible sky, an initiative that could assist in the detection of nanohertz gravitational waves. It's a f new phenomenon in the sky that's really only discovered 10 years ago that we really do not understand. So it's a bit of a mystery right now. It's these short bursts of radio waves coming uh, randomly, but very frequently, something like a thousand times per day. Uh, you can't predict where they're going to come, and so it's actually very challenging to try and understand where these are from. We know they're from very far outside our galaxy, so that means it has to be something that has a huge amount of energy. So there's something in nature that is totally unpredicted, powerful sources of radio waves, but we have no idea what it is, and, and we're hoping CHIME is going to help answer that question. The cosmology and fast radio burst combo is win-win for science, but the real winners are the Canadian taxpayers who enjoy the benefits of having world-leading scientific community and highly skilled trainees with hugely marketable skills relevant to a wide variety of Canadian industries. So we have students involved with every part of this. It turns out there's nothing in there that you could go and just call the right company and say, build me that, because they build something similar, but it's not to do this sort of science. So it turns out the very best people to do this work are, are brilliant young people who have open minds, are ready to learn, and ready to get the job done. There's about, uh, I, I haven't counted the exact number, let's say 35 graduate students at the three institutions involved, and many of them have very key roles. They come forward, they, they become the expert across the world on some small topic that is essential for our success and we rely on them 100%. And so it's so important that, that our government supports these students. They're, they're, they're the leaders, they're, they're us tomorrow, and they are gonna be so much greater than us, us tomorrow as well. Literally everyone in our collaboration had their hand 
on certain part of the telescope. So in the last two months I've been a part of this project. I mean, we've been actually connecting these cables that bring the signal from the, from the focal line to here, and we were connecting all of this. So like professors were here and grad students, so we spend lots of days like actually doing, doing actually physical labor. <laughs> you're, you're actually doing the hands and knees work. Yeah. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And it was great, actually. Like uh, that's that's actually part of excitement of building your own, actually, instrument, and then learning how to do it for the future, and also like you know waiting for the data to come so you can actually do the research from something that you built. It's it's fantastic, and it's amazing if you have this opportunity here in Okanagan to do that. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, we should be actually really proud that that we live in a place that actually uh, you know allow, allows us and gives us an opportunity to do something like this. This telescope is is one of the largest radio telescopes on Earth. Um, the amount of processing it, it does, the number of numbers it crunches to figure out what the sky looks like is the largest on, on planet Earth, Earth today. So it's a big telescope. In size, it's pretty big. In terms of computational power, it's enormous. Now the size, the physical size of this telescope is dictated by the things we want to see on the sky. The bigger your telescope, the smaller the objects are you can see on the sky, the angular scale of them. So in our case, we have a certain science goal. We're trying to map out how the universe evolves and expands. We're trying to see transient phenomena on the sky. And that dictates the size of object we'd like to reconstruct. And that tells us how big this telescope has to be. So here we're the size of about five NHL hockey rinks, 100 meters by 80 meters. And that's determined by the science we'd like to do. Someday, we may take this technology and expand it further and further so that we can have telescopes that are able to see even smaller structures and able to see the sky with greater and greater sensitivity. So this telescope is part of that path of development as well to someday get to enormous scale radio telescope. Thank you. When scientists are empowered to explore, be curious, and ask big questions, they make groundbreaking discoveries that change our world. Breakthroughs in fundamental science lead to improved health, a better life for all Canadians, jobs, new industries. Our government knows it is our duty to give scientists the opportunities and tools they need to pursue the full spectrum of research, from discovery to applied science. And that is why I'm so thrilled to be here today to help officially launch the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, CHIME for short. The telescope was built by Greyback Construction in Penticton, whose normal line of business is building, building supermarkets, building everyday structures and uh, they can build supermarkets to a precision of an eighth of an inch and that's enough. So what you're looking at here is really a supermarket roof, it's just a different shape. You know, we do a lot of outreach here, we have, have visitors every Sunday through the summer and um, it, it's a pleasure to, to talk to kids who come out here then and they know a, a certain professor of physics at Okanagan College who grew up in Penticton and first came to this observatory on a school tour in grade three. But this is a massive and unique installation. It's, it's monumental in terms of history of, of astrophysical research. How does it feel to know that that piece up there is one that you built? Every time I ride by here on my motorbike, I'm gonna look down on this structure and, and feel proud that I was able to have anything to do with it. There are issues where there's, a, there's so much cabling out here and it has to be out in the weather all, all, all year round and still function. And the difficulty of having somebody figure out a straightforward solution when they come from the coast and from Montreal, uh, it's really great that they walk into a family owned business in Penticton and give us a chance to do this. So the community had more of a hand in the building of this than they might realize? Very likely. Uh, I saw also here today there are, there are men from an electrical contracting company that did a, 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 a local Penticton company. Uh, I also heard the name Greyback Construction mentioned by somebody else. So it's been, uh, it's been a large group effort by tradespeople in the valley and uh, it's awesome that we're up to it. 
Well, it, it's phenomenal to see how we are affecting the uh, the future of uh, the information gathering about the, the world and the universe around us. But I think what's really pertinent uh, for me and for Penticton is just how much of Penticton was involved in the manufacture, the installation, the expertise uh, of the development of this incredible telescope. Uh, I'm learning about the fabrication. Uh, a lot of that took place in Penticton. Um, there was uh, design that was involved in it. Um, right, right down to the sheet metal right here as well, the installation of local electrical companies. I think it's phenomenal that we can really draw on the expertise and the, and the pool of talent that we have here in our manufacturing and innovation sectors and, uh, and really give back to the world of science and hopefully we'll, we'll be learning so much more about the universe around us as a result of it. I'm talking with Tracy Kim Bono, who is a traditional knowledge keeper for the Sikh nation. Yeah and uh, roots, berries, and medicine are her domain. And Tracy, you spoke beautifully at the introductions today and the opening of this Chime facility, and you talked about Coyote and the story of him throwing his eyes. And I thought later, as we listened to other speakers addressing the technical aspects of this uh, whole installation, that this was another version of throwing eyes, and I wondered if you saw it that way. Yes, and the interesting part about uh, the Silk people and our knowledge base, our knowledge base is thousands of years old, tens of thousands of year, years old. And so one of the principal characters in our chap, our oral stories, is Sinclip, who is Coyote. And uh, Coyote uh, represents um, a lot of the learning and a lot of the things that we need to understand, um, we needed to understand back then, and that we also need to understand today and one of the stories which is a very long story but I remember one particular part of the story is uh, when Coyote um, and there was a lot of circumstances that were leading up to it in terms of Coyote and what he was doing and his energy and his energy was very dark he had a very dark energy and, and some of the things that he you know was doing come from the dark place and and it's transmitted through our language and so it was really interesting when the minister was talking about dark energy being the largest energy present today i was i was i was in awe of of her speaking about that and and what we know about our oral stories is they're not just tales they're not just fables they're not made up they are um, stories that inform us about our relationships to each other our relationships to the land and also about prophecies about things that we know uh, that we see in the future and so about 15 years ago maybe 20 years ago um, when the internet came and the, the, the technology because I, I I come from an age era where there was no internet and I remember when I was in high school in fact there was the first computer at Penn High so that's technology so when the internet came I was like is that part of the coyote story of when he took his eyes out and he threw them and he threw them for different reasons um, and those reasons like I said are like a part of a longer story um, but when he received them back and when they went around the world into other galaxies and other places, when they came back, he was different and things were different. And it wasn't what he thought it would be. So, so I was thinking today, is that, the pro is that part of that story? It has to be, it must be, because that's how our science works and that's how our knowledge systems work, works, is that those things are contained in those stories that we know um, have uh, have lessons and teachings so you know in, in terms of the work that I'm doing here uh, on this in this territory of uh, our sales people this is our bread basket and this is this area here is uh, I've come to from a very young age with my grandmother Lillian Armstrong and my grandfather William Armstrong and we pick berries and we pick roots and we have ceremonies here so this area is very sacred and it's a very sacred area and, and will continue to be a sacred area and we will continue to do our ceremonies here of the roots and the berries and the land and understanding um, and, you know understanding our worldview and so today was you know um, um, you know there there is there is some energy shifting and there's some frequencies that were explained today from a scientific perspective 
but observing all of this, I know that those frequencies and that energy that we know is coming and the change that is coming in terms of the world and, and modern world, I think that um, I think that there's some higher learning that we're all going to get out of this. I know that all of that is contained within our language, within the Silk language, because I don't know if I fully understand it yet. And I don't know if it's the next generations coming to be that have to remember that story so that they can say one day, that's what it's for. That's the meaning. So it's an unraveling of knowledge and history. I think that about traditional knowledge and traditional science and Indigenous people around the world is that the knowledge that we contain is an old knowledge that is, is primarily unknown because of colonization because of another system and another knowledge system dom dominating you know those people our people your people anybody's people and so the more that we per shift our worldview and look and listen to what the traditional scientists are saying the indigenous scientists and how do those how are those linking western science together and what are the commonalities and what do we need to learn from each other this is a good example of of that taking place like I mean today everything that I'm hearing and seeing I know that we've talked about we've talked about in some way or another and um, little did I know when I was a little girl here you know on the wagon you know my grandpa had a horse and wagon little did I know that we would be part of something so large so extraordinary and so incredibly amazing three two one And there we have it, installation of the final receiver. This is a day for all Canadians to be so proud of the work that has been done here. It is an honour and it's humbling and awe-inspiring to meet the scientists who had the vision to build this, to build something that's unique in the world and is going to answer these big questions. And I think this will become a a household name and people will know this telescope. Thank you.